This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The kingdom of the Lord is a subject over which the religious world has a great deal of confusion. If you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, he will tell you that the kingdom of the Lord was established in 1914. If you talk to a dispensational premillennialist, which really includes most mainstream Christian denominations, he will tell you the kingdom has not yet been established. He'll say it hasn't come yet. Now, he'll say that it's coming soon, but it's not here yet. He will say any time now the rapture is going to take place and the righteous are going to be called away to be with the Lord, and he'll say he knows it soon because he can tell by the signs of the times. Then he says the Antichrist is going to be revealed, the Great Tribulation will take place, finally the Battle of Armageddon will be fought, and then, after all these things, the Lord will establish his earthly kingdom, and he will reign from Jerusalem on the throne of David for a thousand years. You've heard people speak of the, the thousand-year reign of the kingdom. When I was a kid, for a short time I attended a, a private school that was run by the Baptist church. And at that school, they taught us to say the Lord's Prayer, and, and they taught us to pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Why? Because they believe the kingdom has not yet come. And friends, a lot of people believe that. Bookstores are, are filled with this teaching. Every week, denominational preachers get in the pulpit and, and they teach this. And really, you don't even have to leave your house to hear it. You can turn on your television set and tune in to Jack Van Impey and, and hear him teach this on a weekly basis. Now, with such a great deal of misunderstanding in the world about the kingdom of the Lord, it's very important that we study this to see what the Bible has to say. What does God have to say about His kingdom? We're going to study four points in this lesson to help us learn the nature and identity of the Lord's kingdom. All right, our first point is going to be when. It's a question. When was the Lord's kingdom established? Now, premillennialists will tell you that it has not been established. But when we go back and look at the Bible, that is not what we find. Now, I want to begin our study in Daniel chapter 2, in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 2, because we find something there that is very important about when the Lord's kingdom would be established. It's, it's a prophecy of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, God's people, the Israelites, are in captivity in Babylon. And the king at that time was named Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had a dream, and his dream really troubled him. And he woke up and, and he wanted to know the meaning of the dream. And so he called together his magicians and his sorcerers and, and he commanded that first they tell him the dream and then secondly they tell him the meaning of the dream. And this appears to be a test because it seems that he was thinking if they could tell the dream then he would know their interpretation of the dream was also reliable. Well, none of them were able to do it. None of them could tell the dream. And so the king's orders went out that all of these wise men, these sorcerers and magicians, were to be killed. Well, there was a man named Daniel. He was one of God's people, and he was a captive from Israel, and he is there in Babylon. Well, he learns about the problem, and he tells King Nebuchadnezzar, I can do what you've asked. So he sets up a time to do this. And so God reveals Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Daniel while he's sleeping. And then Daniel returns to King Nebuchadnezzar with the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel says, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you dreamed about a huge statue that had a head made out of gold. He said, its chest and arms, they were made out of, out of silver. He said, its middle section and, and the thighs were made of bronze, its legs were made of iron, and its feet were made partially of iron and, and partially of clay. And then he said a, a giant stone not cut out by man, it, it struck the image on its feet and it broke them to pieces. Then he says all the parts of the image were, were crushed into small pieces and were blown away by the wind. 
Then he said, the stone that struck the image, the stone that struck this statue, it grew into a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Daniel said, that is the dream. Now I will tell you the interpretation. And so first, Daniel talks about this head of gold. The image had a head made out of gold. Now this is verse 37 of Daniel chapter 2. He says, You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the earth and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold." And so Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, the head of gold represents you. It, it is your empire. Now, at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest power in the world. In fact, verse 38 is pointing out the range of his great power and authority. That is, again, he says, wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them. And so he said, the head of gold represents the Babylonian empire. That is, the empire of King Nebuchadnezzar. But then he talks about the second section of this statue, this image, and that is the chest and arms of silver. Listen to verse 39 of Daniel 2. He says, But after you, after King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. The chest and arms of silver represented a second kingdom that would come after him, that is following King Nebuchadnezzar, and verse 39 says that it will be an inferior kingdom. Now, history tells us that in 539 BC, the great Babylonian empire was taken over by the Medo-Persians, which was dominated by Persia. This chest of silver and arms of silver are representative of that empire. It is the empire of the Medo-Persians. Okay, the third section of this statue, of this image, Daniel said, is the belly and thighs of bronze. Now, let's continue in verse 39. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. I want you to notice particularly that it is pointed out about this third kingdom that it would rule all of the earth. History indicates that this third empire that followed the Medo-Persians and that ruled the world was the Greek Empire. It was that of Alexander the Great. You know, this fact is also confirmed that, that this is Greece because Daniel has a second vision in Daniel chapter 8, 20, and 21 which identifies this as the Greek Empire. In the 300s BC, Alexander the Great unquestionably established his power over the Persians. And so, the third section of the image, the belly and thighs of bronze, represents Greece. Well, then he moves to the fourth section of this image. It is the legs of iron. Verse 40 says, And the fourth empire, the fourth kingdom, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, if you know anything about ancient history, you know immediately this is talking about Rome, this empire that is as strong as iron, that overtook the Greek empire, could be none other than the mighty Roman empire. Now verse 41, "...whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it." just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile." And so he says the iron and the clay mixed describes the weakness of the Roman Empire and her Caesars. Okay, now look at verse 44. This is really the key to our discussion. "...and in the days of these kings," that is, the Roman Empire, "...and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." Friends, this verse is one of the most important verses of prophecy in the Old Testament. 
it is a very specific prophecy because the Lord tells us not only that He's going to establish a kingdom, but He tells us when. Way back in the book of Daniel, the Lord informed us that His kingdom was going to be set up in the days of the Roman Empire. Well, the days of the Roman Empire come. We move forward in history and, and Rome is ruling the world. What do we find? Well, we find John the Baptist preaching about the kingdom. Matthew chapter 3, 1 and 2, the Bible says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now John said the kingdom hasn't come yet, but he said it's coming very soon. What else do we find? We find the apostles of Jesus preaching about the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7, Jesus sent His apostles out on what we call the limited commission. And He told them, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, again, Jesus is saying the kingdom has not yet come, but it is very near. A prominent part of Jesus' preaching was about the kingdom. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, friends, what was Jesus saying? He was saying the kingdom hasn't been established yet, but it is very close. It's coming very soon. Now, how close was it? Listen to Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 because it really narrows this down. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. How close was the kingdom? Jesus said within the lifetime of some of you standing here, you will not die until you see the kingdom. Well, we keep moving forward in history. We get to Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. This is just before Jesus ascends back into heaven. His disciples ask Him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And so the kingdom was very, very, very close, but it had not yet come. Well, we keep going forward. You get to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, and we read, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, what had happened between the time of the ascension of Jesus, because the kingdom had not come at that time, and Paul writing to the Colossian Christians? Well, the kingdom had been set up because Paul said that he and the Colossian Christians were in the kingdom. Well, we go forward a little further in history. We get to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. This is near the end of the first century. The Apostle John referred to himself as Quote, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Now, that means that the kingdom had come within the first century during the time of the Roman Empire. And friends, that's the reason that we don't pray today, thy kingdom come. The Lord taught His disciples to pray, Matthew 6 and verse 10, thy kingdom come because the kingdom was soon. They were awaiting the kingdom. But today we don't pray that because the kingdom has come. And so, if the kingdom has not come, as the premillennialist will say, then that means, number one, Daniel was wrong about it coming during the days of the Roman Empire. Number two, it would mean that John the Baptist and the apostles were mistaken about the kingdom being at hand. Number three, it would mean that the Lord missed it when He said that it would come within the lifetime of some of those people standing in His presence. And number four, it means that Paul was mistaken when he wrote to the Colossian Christians. Number five, it means that John begins the book of Revelation with a lie. But friends, we don't have to worry about any of those things because the kingdom did come. And so our first question is, when? When did the kingdom come? And the answer is, in the first century, during the days of the Roman Empire. Now, our second question is what? Our first question was when. Our second question is what? What is the nature of the Lord's kingdom? What is it like? All right, I want to notice several things. First, it is a kingdom of great importance. Now, friends, that is evident from all the preaching 
that is done on the kingdom. It is evident that it's a kingdom of great importance by the fact that Daniel and the prophets spoke about it hundreds of years before its establishment. It is evident that it is a kingdom of great importance from the fact that John the Baptist was preaching about it and the Lord was preaching about it and His disciples, His apostles were preaching about it. You know, the Lord only has to say something once for us to know it's important, but when it's repeated over and over and over again, I know that it is of prime importance. And so the kingdom of the Lord is a very, very important subject. Secondly, what is the nature of the Lord's kingdom? Secondly, it is a spiritual kingdom. Friends, the Lord's kingdom is not a physical kingdom like the apostles were expecting. You know, it's interesting to me that premillennialists today make the same mistake that the people of Jesus' day did. That is, they are looking for an earthly kingdom. But Jesus specifically said, My kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. You know, when Jesus was standing before Pilate, Pilate demanded of Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Friends, I don't know how it could have been stated any more plainly than that. Jesus said it is not a physical kingdom. Now, I'm going to tell you something that, that might shock you. Most of the Christian denominations in the world, most of them believe that Christ came intending to set up an earthly kingdom. But they believe He failed at that because the Jews rejected Him. And so they think He's going to try again in the near future. Friends, first, that is insulting to the power of God. Secondly, John chapter 6 and verse 15, I want you to listen to this. Listen to this passage and, and then we're going to make an observation. John 6, 15 says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take Him by force to make Him king, He departed again to the mountain by Himself alone. Now, friends, if Jesus had intended to set up an earthly kingdom, the Bible tells us He had every opportunity to do so. They were trying to make Him a king, but that was not His intent. His intention was never to set up an earthly kingdom. Now, thirdly, the Lord's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. First, it's a kingdom of great importance. Secondly, it's a spiritual kingdom. Thirdly, it is an eternal kingdom. Now, going back to Daniel. Daniel said, Daniel chapter 2, And in the days of these kings, that is the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever." Daniel 2.44. Now, that's important. The Lord's kingdom is not going to be a 1,000-year kingdom. He says it will stand forever. Friends, there is no earthly kingdom that can do that because this kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord, is going to outlast this earth. 1 Corinthians 15.24 says, Then comes the end, at the end of time, then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. The Lord's kingdom is going to last until the end of this earth and then it is going to be transferred to heaven into the hands of the Father. Now fourthly, I want us to observe this as we talk about the what of the kingdom. The Lord's kingdom cannot be a literal kingdom in Jerusalem. Now that is commonly taught dispensational premillennialism, that is, most mainstream Christian denominations teach that they say Christ is going to return to this earth, He's going to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem, and He's going to reign for a thousand years. Dear friend, would you observe with me that there is not a single passage in the Bible that says that Jesus will ever set foot upon this earth again? Have you ever thought about that? There's not a passage in the Bible that teaches Jesus will ever be on this earth. But you know, there are passages that tell us that Christ cannot rule upon this earth. There are passages that tell us Christ cannot rule upon this earth. Now you may say, where? Where are there such passages? One such passage is Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13. It tells us that Christ will be a priest 
while he is on his throne. Now listen to this. It gets a little bit confusing, but this is important. Zechariah 6.13 tells us Christ will be a priest while he is on his throne. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4 says, For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Now what does that mean? He's going to be a priest while he's on the throne. If he were on the earth, he would not be a priest. And so what that tells us is when you put these two verses together, he cannot have a throne that is on this earth. Otherwise, we have a contradiction of two passages. Jesus will not sit on a throne and reign on this earth. God has forbidden that Christ should reign upon a literal throne in Jerusalem. Now, a second reason why Jesus cannot rule on a literal throne in Jerusalem is found back in the book of Jeremiah. Now, follow me with this. This is very important. Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 28 through 30, there is a promise made of God that no one who is a descendant of Jeconiah would ever rule again in Judah. Now, Judah is where Jerusalem is. Now, it's very fascinating when you get to the New Testament and you read Matthew chapter 1 and verse 12, we learn that Jeconiah is in the genealogy of Christ. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details here. He's called Coniah in Jeremiah, but if you study the genealogies, you'll see this is the same person. Now, what does that mean? Jeremiah says a person who is a descendant of Jeconiah cannot rule in Jerusalem, in, in Judah. We find that Jesus is a descendant of Jeconiah. Friends, that means that Christ cannot rule on a literal throne in Jerusalem. But you know what? It doesn't matter because Jesus told us, my kingdom is not of this world. And in Acts chapter 2, 20 through 33, we are told that Jesus' throne is not on this earth. It is in heaven. Now, our third question is who? The first question was when. The second question is what. The third question is who? Who are the members of the Lord's kingdom? You know, every kingdom must have certain things. First, every kingdom must, of course, have a king or, or a head. So let's ask the question, who is the head of the Lord's kingdom? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says about the early Christians that God has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, clearly that is a reference to Christ. It is His kingdom. And since it has already been established, that means he, has, he is already reigning over it. Now, I know that premillennial preachers will tell you that Jesus will not start reigning over His kingdom until sometime in the future. But you know, Romans chapter 9 and verse 5 says, Christ is over all. Not that He will be, but He is over all. Now secondly, every kingdom must also have a population. That is, a kingdom must have citizens who comprise that kingdom. So who is the population of the Lord's kingdom? Now again, Paul writes to the Colossian Christians, Colossians 1 and verse 13, he says, He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Paul identified himself and all of the Christians to whom he was writing as being part of the population of the kingdom. Revelation 1 and verse 9 says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Now, John said that he was in the kingdom. But did you catch what else he said? He said that he was a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. A companion with whom? Well, to those to whom he wrote the letter. Now, who is that? Revelation 1 and verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Now, who at this point are the servants? Well, it's Christians. What does that mean? John said he was in the kingdom. He said that his fellow Christians were in the kingdom. Paul said he was in the kingdom. He said those to whom he was writing were in the kingdom. Friends, that means Christians are the citizens of God's kingdom. Now, friends, here's the conclusion of all of this. Here is where all of the evidence is pointing, and this is what I really want you to get. The kingdom is the church. Friends, every Christian should know this. 
And every Christian ought to be able to show this from the Scriptures because the evidence overwhelmingly points to this fact. When was the kingdom to be established? In the days of the Roman Empire, soon after Jesus preached, within the lifetime of some of them that heard Jesus. When was the church established? In exactly that same time. Well, who are the members of the kingdom? They are Christians. Paul said that he had delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, Colossians 1.13. Who are the members of the church? They are Christians. And so the members of the kingdom are Christians. The members of the church are Christians. Peter speaks of Christians as being called out of darkness into His marvelous light, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Well, who is the head of the kingdom? Well, it's Christ. Who is the head of the church? Colossians 1.18, in the same context of, of talking about being translated into the kingdom, the Bible says that Christ is the head of the body, the church. Well, what about the nature of the kingdom? It is a spiritual one. What about the nature of the church? Peter wrote to the early church, You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. And friends, lest anyone miss it, Jesus identified for us His church as the kingdom. I want you to notice with me in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now listen to this part. This is what I'm getting to. He said, And I say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven." Now friends, this is very important. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And so the Lord used the terms church and kingdom interchangeably. And He is then telling us that they are one and the same. And so anytime you see a reference to the church, and you read about the kingdom, you know that they can be used interchangeably. Friends, today to be in the kingdom of the Lord is to be in the church of the Lord. Now, again, I know premillennialists will say that the kingdom has not yet come, but their assertion will simply not stand the test of the Scriptures. If you want to learn more about becoming a member of the Lord's kingdom, which is synonymous with becoming a Christian, we invite you to visit the links on the screen, and God bless.